Somebody say amen tonight. Reminds you that Monday night prayer meeting has turned into Monday night revival. We're having a mighty move of God. The last three weeks have been just an awesome touch of God in our prayer time. Come and be with us, for prayer is powerful. Amen. Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. We're talking about forgiveness for the family or family salvation. And we're taking this story out of Acts 16 where Paul and Silas were in jail and they began to worship and sing at midnight and the Holy Ghost moved and the Spirit of God. You know, you know that's the reason we like and encourage you to worship through the singing, not be entertained by the singing, to worship through the singing, worship through the preaching because that's when the Holy Ghost can get to move. You give him the Holy Ghost a jump start. Say, go Holy Ghost. Here we are, we yield ourselves. And they began to praise God, and when they began to sing and praise God, every one of the jail cells opened wide. The bonds, the chains fell apart, and everybody set free. I said this many times, but it fits real good right here. Maybe you're not a shouter. Maybe it takes a racetrack or a ball game to get you excited. But you ought to thank God we got some folk in church that still love to praise God. Now, I know it ain't all about noise, but noise is part of it. And you ought to be glad you got some praisers in here because while you're sitting there sophisticated and being entertained, they're getting the chains off of you and opening prison doors, and you're going to leave here free. Hallelujah. Nothing you did in yourself but your neighbor. And then, then, then the jailer thought everybody had escaped, but Paul said, no, we're right here. And uh, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, ain't that just like God? See, when God gets to move and he starts talking to you and speaking to you about getting saved, or either about drawing closer to God, challenges you, not entertain you, challenge you. This is what they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt be saved. And thy household. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight would you breathe that fresh word into our spirits and our hearts. Let this word become an anchor that holds in the midst of the storms of life. Feed us manna. God, touch us. Encourage us. God, I pray that this Wednesday night uh, Bible study or preaching study would stir up a fire in our lives, a fresh fire that would catch and begin to move in our homes and in our families. We ask this in Jesus' name and everybody shouts. I want to talk to you tonight about your role in family salvation. What is your role in family salvation? When a person gets saved or receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's the greatest thing that could ever happen. But the second greatest thing, I believe, is that your loved ones come to know the Lord. Uh, uh, one of the things the rich man cried out in hell from was after he found out he could not get any water, he focused on his family. And he says, send somebody that they won't come here. I believe it's important that we care about our families. And we're living in a day and age in which our families are not responding sometimes to the word of the Lord. Now, I believe the Bible Bible is filled with men and women that are examples and patterns for us to follow today. Biblical principles that will work in your family. It's sad to say a lot of families uh, are angry because you got saved. Your husband never was as mean to you as he is after you got saved. Sometimes it stirs up something. Sometimes they mock us and resent us. And sometimes it causes the home to divide. And serving God or serving the devil. And there's a divide there. There's a difficult way to live. And, and home becomes a war zone. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It causes tension and turmoil with your children. Because you try to raise up standards in your life and in your family. And your children re re rebel against that. But you know you've got to live by truth. And so sometimes it causes conflict in our marriages. It would be a terrible thing, though, to lose our families to hell, wouldn't it? Believers today, many are saved and ready for heaven, but many of your family members are not saved. How many, let me get a, a, 
Have you got family members not saved? All right, we understand that. We look to God for help, and that's good. And we have said this. Your family's salvation is connected to your commitment to God. In other words, if you want your family saved, you yourself must get connected and committed to this word and to the things of God. The closer you get to God and the closer you walk in the word, the more it will have an effect upon your family and the light will shine and conviction will fall. Amen. So, so we play a role in the destiny of their soul. I believe that it's time that we look through the scriptures and find out what we can do. Look at Noah, for example. Uh, Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That the very imagination of the thoughts of his heart were e- evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he even made man in the earth. And it had grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man. I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping thing, fowls. And it repented that I have made them. But, somebody shall but. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Noah was a man that found favor in the eyes. He was a just man in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Nobody else was walking with God, but Noah walked with God. Let me say this to you. It don't matter what everybody else is doing. It don't matter that everybody else is saying, now that since COVID, we don't need to go to church. If they don't want to come to church, that's between them and God. Uh, You don't have to live right. That's between them and God. But as for me and my house, I believe it's time to serve God. Amen. So you got to raise up a standard in your house. The Living Bible gives us a clear insight of this man, Noah. It says, Noah was a pleasure to the Lord. Now, how do you become a pleasure to God? By living right. He was the only true righteous man living on the earth at that time. He tried everything he could to conduct his life according to God's will. He submitted himself and yielded himself to God's will. When he got up of a morning, he said, today I want to please God. Today I want to pleasure God. Today I want to live for God. When the King James Version says Noah was perfect, does not mean he didn't have any faults. It means in the Hebrew, he was sincere and upright. And today we need hearts that are sincere and upright. Somebody shout amen. Now there's a lot of things that you can do, but, but if your heart is sincere, God will honor a sincere heart. Noah was a just man. He walked with God. And because he did, God kept him safe from the flood. Not only did he save Noah, but listen now, he saved his entire family. He told Noah, you build an ark. Now, if God could speak the world into existence, if he could say sun be and sun was there and moon be and star, he could could have done the same thing with an ark. But he said, Noah, you build that ark. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, it's our responsibility to build an ark for our children and grandchildren. Can I get a witness out there? Somebody say amen. When the ark was complete, God spoke to Noah and said, he said, come thou and all thy house, all of your family. I'm concerned over your family. Noah, you've been walking righteous, and it's going to affect your family. And to the ark that I have seen righteousness before me. Noah's righteous life pleased God. And when the day of the flood came, his righteous stand saved Noah and his family. That lets us know that that it takes a righteous stand and a righteous standard in the life and in the home of your family, and God will honor that and save your children. God cannot honor people that live one way on Sunday morning and another way Monday through Saturday. God can't live people that shout around the church on on Sunday and cuss you out on Monday. God can't bless people that are phonies and fakes and hypocrites. you got to rise up and be real. God, hey, you may fool some of the people some of the time, but you never fool God. And God's got his eye on you. And when God sees somebody that's real, somebody that's out there in the world, but you're real, God will bless you. And that blessing and that honor and that righteousness will connect your family to family salvation. If you want your family saved, build an ark. Somebody shout build an ark. Build an altar. Build a place of prayer in your home. It's good to come to church, but you ought to have church in your home. Well, we're so mad at, at, at the woman that took prayer out of schools. Man, we blast her, but we took prayer out of the homes a long time before she took them out of school. If you'll have an altar at home, you don't have to worry about school. 
And so Noah's family was saved. And you can be saved. And here's the key. Here's the pattern. Righteousness. When you live right. When you do what's right. When you walk right before God. Now, we're living in a generation that tells us that we can live any old way and everybody's going to heaven. So now we have homosexuals that are right. We have adulterers that are right. We have liars that are right. We have uh, 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 drug addicts that are right. But God is seeing that perversion and he's saying, that's not right. If you want your family saved, walk in righteousness. Can I share this with you? You say, well, they tell me today that it doesn't nothing wrong with living together without marriage. You're wrong, and the Bible's right. They tell us it's all right to ordain homosexuals. You're wrong, and the Bible's right. You tell me it's okay to get high and do a little bit of drinking, a little bit of drugs. You're wrong, and the Bible's right. Somebody shout amen. I don't care what you say. You're wrong, and God is right. The next man that took a, a stand and took action was Abraham. Four kings made war against Sodom. And Abraham's nephew was in Sodom. And, and so those kings began to war against Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they took captive all of Lot's family and, and Abraham's brother's son. They dwelt in Sodom and his goods. And, and they took them all prisoner. So the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were defeated. And Lot and his family were taken captive. That's just like the devil. He wants to take you captive. He wants you in chains and in bonds. He wants you to a place you cannot have any liberty or any freedom. It's not good enough just to defeat you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to take you captive. Many of our loved ones tonight are taken captive. They are captive to, to deception. They are captive to uh, wrong things. They are captive to habits. They're captive to things that everybody today is saying nothing wrong. They're taken captive by it, and they have no freedom. Uh, many of our loved ones are bound by chains of drugs and alcohol and uncleanness. They're hurting and suffering and dying, and it grieves our, uh, 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 our spirit and breaks our heart. What can we do? Look what Lot did. Or Abraham did. Abraham was faced with a similar situation. He didn't just cry and say, I told Lot not to go to Sodom. He didn't say he should have known better. He gotten himself in a mess. Now, let me pause and help you right here. Because I've been guilty of this and I had to repent of it. If you're not careful, you get an attitude toward people that can go to Walmart and go to the mountains and go to the beach, but they can't come to church. Now, if you're not careful, you get an attitude. And when you see them, you get an mm, attitude. That ain't no way to greet them. Just do like Moses and stand in the gap for them and say, God, just don't let them die and go to hell. God, I know they're wrong, but don't let them die and go to hell. And so, so Abraham, he, he didn't fuss. He didn't say, Lot's gotten him in a mess. Nothing I can do about it. I told him that, uh, that I would help him. I wish he would have listened to me. Uh, he didn't give up on Lot. But he didn't walk the floor and wring his hands and pull out his hair. He, he didn't call to get a Valium or a tranquilizer. He didn't call for counseling. He didn't crawl in a hole somewhere and hide. But he didn't let nothing shake his faith in God. He said, things look bad, but there's a God in heaven. It looks impossible, but God. And when I look back over my life, I wouldn't be here tonight if God hadn't did it. I serve a God that can still do it. So whatever I'm facing, God can do it. That's what Abraham said. So Abraham said, well, I'll just take action. I'll go in after him. When Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed and trained his servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them into Dan. He divided against them and his servants by night and smote them, pursued unto Hoboam, and which is on the left hand of Damascus. He brought back all the goods, and again, his brother Lot's son, uh, uh, his brother, and his goods, and the women that were with him, you know what he did? He went in there. He said, listen, I'm not going to let you have my family. When's the last time you told the devil that? We got too many people rolling over and say, nothing I can do. You need to point your finger in the face of the devil and say, you're not going to have my family. Yeah. 
I'm not going to fuss about them. I'm not going to condemn them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to uh, try to uh, uh, just, just uh, uh, condemn them. I'm just going to tell you, devil, you're not going to have my family. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my marriage. Because anybody stand flat-footed in the spirit and say, devil, you're not going to have them. See, that's when you become militant. God is looking for his church in the last days to become militant. You can't sit there passive and be in a We need a stirring in the church, a stirring of Holy Ghost power, a stirring of a move of God, and become militant. The violent take it by force. And I'm telling you, devil, you're not going to have my family. That's the attitude. Abraham said, I'll tell you what, you may have them, but you're not going to keep them. Have you told drugs that, like, Drugs, you may have them, but you're not going to keep them. Alcohol, you may have them, but you're not going to keep them. Adultery, you may have them, but you're not going to keep them. I'm putting on the whole armor of God. I'm taking up the weapons of my warfare. Because God is calling us in the last days to war in the spirit for our families. We must have that spirit of a warrior upon us. we got to let the devil know, hey, we're not rolling over and playing dead. We're not going to hide on a church pew. We're not going to let you run over us, rush shot over us. We're going to rise up in the name of Jesus and demand put our families back. In the natural, if someone had come to your house, harm your child, dragging them out the door, what would you do? Would you say, oh, well, that guy's so much bigger than I am. Would you wave goodbye to the old little baby and say, I'll be praying for you, honey. Would you call the drugs and say, somebody send me some volume over. I'm having a bad day. Would you run to your phone while the kidnapper's putting your child in the car to call prayer partners to intercede for you? I know what would happen. You would be on that kidnapper like a chainsaw. You little 90-pound ladies would scratch his eyes out. He thinks he's big and bad and he's pumping iron. But it don't make no difference. If he's after my child, I, that you, I know what you'll do. You'll go after him no matter what. Doesn't matter how many weapons he's got. No matter if he's got a gun or a knife, a baseball bat, friend. I'm going to tell you, if you really love your child, you, he's got to kill you to leave home with your child. Am I preaching it? And, and he's got to pry your dead, cold fingers off his throat because you're not giving up. Can I hear somebody say amen? That's the desperation we need in the spirit when the devil's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. You say, devil, I'll jump on you. You're not going to have my family. I'll fight you tooth and toenail. I will do everything I can. But you're not leaving here with my family. My family's not going to die in adultery. My family's not going to die drunk. My family's not going to die high. No, sir, they're not. I will not allow it. But now listen. In the spirit, here's what we do. Y'all pray for us. Y'all put them on a prayer list now. I'm not coming Monday night to pray, but put them on the prayer list. We are so, well, just, just try to get people to pray. And that's good. I'm not saying that's not good. But you, that's your family. That's your child. Can't nobody pray for your children like you can. Let's be honest. Don't nobody love them like you love them. But I'm telling you what you can do. You can say, devil, I am sick and tired of what you're doing to my child. You know, you know what you need? You need to camp out in their room. Now, they be out doing drugs, out drunk, out doing something crazy. You go in the room with a bottle of oil. Anoint everything in that room. Anoint the pillow, the bed, the, po uh, the bed post, the door, the door seals, uh, the computer, uh, uh, their closet, their clothes, their shoes. Hey, man. I mean, pour oil on everything and get a militant attitude. Don't go in there feeling sorry for yourself. Go in there with your shoulders pulled back and say, Devil, you shouldn't have been messing with my family. Now you're going to get it. And when you go into your, uh, get this now, when you go into your child's room, when you go in the room, I tell you, here's what to do. When you go in, shut it and lock it. And say, Devil's just me and you now. <laughs> Hallelujah, you're going to get it. That's the attitude to have, the warrior mentality, the intensity to go after them. Now let me talk about Joshua for a moment. Uh, another person boldly saved his family was Joshua. He simply made his mind up. He got determined and settled. He said, I'm going to serve the Lord. He, he started with the right decision. 
a made up mind, a settled mind. He said, I'll tell you what, I asked for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. In other words, I've got rules in my house. I, I, I'm, we're going to live by these rules. We're going to church on Sunday morning. Uh, uh, you, we're going to church on Monday nights. We're going to church on Wednesday nights. We're going to revival. We're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So kids, you might as well get ready. No need to argue. No need to fuss. You go get it or get a belt one. I didn't have an option when I was a child. Now, when I was a child, they didn't have children's church. Boy, I wish they had it. But we, they didn't have padded pews. If you moved, the pew would squeak. Mama would say, you better be still. Once. Once. The second time, you were being escorted out to the bathroom. I, I remember this little comical story. Many of you may know H.B. Askew is a friend of mine. His son, Craig, when he was a little boy. They were in the church, and Craig was being mischievous, and he was messing around, and H.B. said something like, don't do that. I mean, about the second time, he kind of snatched him up by the arm, and they headed toward the bathroom. But got back to the back door, he, Craig cried out. He said, y'all pray. <laughs> he knew he was going to get it for Miss Bay. I want to tell you, when we bring our children to church, we ought to put them in the children's ministry or, or, or wherever their ministry is or sit them beside us and say, you're going to listen to the word of God. We're going to serve God. Now, now if you're going to sit in here in the adult church, you're going to act like an adult. You're going to come down to the altar. You're going to pray. You're going to seek God. You're going to follow my leadership because I have decided we're going to serve God because Joshua served the Lord. Uh, it had an effect on his family. Uh, your family is watching you. They know whether you're real or not. I'd rather for Joyce to have confidence in me than any of you guys. She lives with me. She knows how I respond under pressure. She knows the times I steal away and pray. She knows my life. Am I perfect? By no means. But I pray and I seek God and she knows that. And I guarantee you can drill her after church and she'll tell you she's married to a man of God. I'd rather my family see uh, uh, God in me than anything. I I'd rather see my family to see the Lord in me than have a million dollars. Because I believe that when, when, when the chips are laid down and you need prayer, that's who you're going to call. Somebody, somebody that knows how to pray. And so Joshua made his mind up. He said, my family's going to get this. If you decide that you're going to serve God, your co commitment and your dedication will be so powerful that it will Cause your children to follow Christ. You say, well, I don't believe that. I've done everything I know to do. My kids are out there. Well, here's what to do. Keep serving God. And, and, and serving greater and more, to, more intense. Uh, you know, this is one of the most powerful ways yeah. you get your children saved. Yeah. You won't get your children saved by just praying. Right. I know that sounds hard. By just fasting. By just reading your Bible. Mm -hmm. You'll get your children saved when you commit totally. To God and what you've been praying and what you've been reading and where you've been going to church gets in you and now uh, uh, I heard the story about a young teenager who was in revival and the evangelist was, was they were having a tremendous service and the teenager was sitting on the back row and the pastor went back and asked the teenager please come to the altar your mom and dad are praying for you we love you here at this church don't die and go to hell and the, the, the boy looked up at him and said, my dad praying for me? He said, he's an usher. He's on the board here. He acts so holy. He gets home. He cusses like a sailor. He watches bad stuff on TV. He treats me and mom uh, bad. If he's a Christian, I don't want it. So what we need to do is say, that ain't a Christian. Here it is. Here's the Christian. I'm going to love and forgive. I'm going to pray and care about people. And that's what your family is looking for. Listen. If you do drugs, your kids are going to do drugs probably. If you sleep around, they're going to sleep around. If you decide to shack up with your boyfriend, your daughter's probably going to shack up with her boyfriend. If you decide you're going to watch X stuff on TV and vulgar and unclean stuff, your children are going to watch it. Joshua said you got a choice. And the way you get your family said if you make a choice, you make a decision. He said... Set before you is life and death. He said, you can choose what you want, what you allow. If you say, if you treat the church like it's a part-time institution, 
that everything else is important but the church? When your kids grow up, that's how they're going to feel about it. Mom and dad miss church every other Sunday. I'm going to miss it. Amen. And so Joshua said, I'm putting my foot down. We're going to serve the Lord. And because this man made a decision, his entire family was saved. We choose the Lord. Look at Rahab, and I'm going to probably close on her. She was a harlot. Wow. She wouldn't be welcome in some churches. The first thing we'd have did when she came into this church was measure her dress to see how short it was, to check out how much makeup she had on, to see how much jewelry. I mean, this would, that would be what we were more in, involved in and concerned. Remember, I told you the story about one of the members, he's dead and gone now, called me one Wednesday night before church, and said, I, I picked up a stranger. He's a young man. And he asked me where I was going. And I said, I was going to church. And he said, I want to go too. And I looked at his shirt. He said, he's got on a filthy T-shirt. It's vulgar. I said, bring him anyhow. I'd have problems with it if one of the members broke. He came in. He said, right about middle way on the right side. And I preached my heart out. Amen. And when I gave the altar call, that vulgar, unclean t-shirt that's all most people saw well the man inside that shirt walked right down here and gave his life to Christ somebody say amen the Bible identifies Rahab as the harlot she is living a horrible life and when Joshua sent the twelve spies and two of the spies happened to go to Rahab's house and the king looked to to, after them to try to find them and she hid them on the roof she sent the king's soldiers on a false trail and the spies were saved and this is what she asked <coughs> therefore I pray you swear me by the Lord since I have shown you kindness that you will also show my father's house kind she didn't say show me kindness notice that she didn't, she didn't even beg for herself she said show my family and give me a true token that you will save alive my father my mother my brother and my sister She's concerned. The man agreed and told her to hang a scarlet thread in the window, symbolic, symbolic of the blood of Jesus, as Jesus saves the home. And I, look what happened, Joshua 6, 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men that had spied the country, go to the harlot's house, bring out the, the woman and all she hath, all of her family, the young men that were spies went in, brought the family out, and they were saved. And here's the biblical principle that saved their family. She was kind to the men of God. Boy, this is going to touch home right here. She showed loving kindness. I believe this reveals one of the most powerful principles today. When we have so many opinions about television preachers or preachers and we have voiced our opinion so carelessly and we say negative things and we verbally attack preachers and evangelists and teachers and we find fault with pastors and I firmly believe that has cursed our lives and cursed our families it's a dangerous thing to touch God's anointing good bad or ugly pray for him I said good bad or ugly pray for him when Miriam, Moses' sister, spoke against the man of God, she was smoked with leprosy. When the young people laughed and mocked at Elisha, a bear came out and devoured them. When Michal, David's wife and daughter of Saul, criticized the way he worshipped, criticized the way he was worshiping God, then she, the Bible says she had no children. Her womb was cursed and become barren. It's no wonder that when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, he said, God forbid that I touch God's anointing. Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said that Shimei, who spoke against David, should be put to death. But David said, leave him alone. Don't bring a curse on your family by always saying something negative about somebody in ministry. Amen? Now, I know you look on the TV, and there are some great preachers on TV, and maybe there's some you don't like. Those you don't like, don't watch them. But don't talk about them. All I hear so-and-so do is ask for money. Quit watching so-and-so. And bless so-and-so. Come on now, amen. One of the top preachers on television that many 
if you listen to him, many say, all he talks about is money, money, money. And I said, well, I, I met him one time. And he and I went out to lunch one time. And we sat across the table and talked. And he sowed into my life, and he wasn't sowing money. He sowed me some biblical truths that I believe as a young pastor changed my life. So, so why are you talking about all he wants is your money? Well, he sowed more than money into my life. He never asked me for a dime. He was teaching at a, a, a large church, and he had all kinds of teaching tools. And he went to his car, and he came back, and he gave me all the tools he had. He said, you don't owe me one dime. God bless you. Wow. So now, now, before you begin to, to talk negatively about somebody, remember, maybe God's anointed. And, and if you talk bad about them, it may disconnect you from family salvation. So when people say, what do you think about old so-and-so? God bless him. What do you think about this one? God bless them. God bless these men of God. Here's what I'm believing. I'm believing God is raising up great men and women of God in the last days. And there's going to be a supernatural anointing upon our lives. And we're going to preach in this latter day revival. And this latter day revival is going to bring in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody give God praise.